Well, good evening, everyone. Michael Soothing here once again. Today, I'm going to look a little bit through the entertainment pages of the Register Guard Oregonian paper. It's actually for, what paper is this? Eugene Springfield. Look, the artist as the provocateur. But mostly we're going to look at recent movies, uh, recent releases, and see what they say in this paper with a little summary description and a review. So that if you feel like going to the movies, maybe we'll see if there's anything worth watching out there at this moment. I have no idea. I haven't been to the movies in I don't know how long. A couple of years at least. I get too annoyed to go, you know, because people are talking and they're on cell phones and there's kids and I just don't quite have the patience for that. I'd rather watch a movie at home with a good stereo system and a flat screen display. Gen genre bending art involves film, dance, painting, fashion, and music. It says here, see what that's about before we start looking at the film reviews. Uh, here we are. Something called Jojo. Staging at the Holt Center. A Ghanasian, Ghanesian artist. That means from Ghana, I take it. Live performance. Um, a transformative condition is what the artist Jojo Abbott strives to deliver. My work is designed to be provocative, she says, bringing you to a state of remembrance. A state of remembrance. You know, and here's a couple of uh, examples, the state of of remembrance that I have when I see this is to remember nightmares I've had in the past where weird monsters were chasing me on city streets. So I'm not so sure that uh, it's achieving the artist's intended result. Usually when I read this kind of flowery prose symbolic nonsense about art. I know it's going to be bad, but maybe that's just because I don't understand. Okay, anyway, that's probably it, right? Now showing. Oh, here's the page I wanted to read. The movies. I have pain in my stomach from a terrible out of food poisoning that's lasted for a week. So I'm gonna have a ginger chew. That's a little loud, I can see. Um, I even know how, I know how I got it. It wasn't restaurant food. It was my own fault. You see, we keep going back and forth between these two houses. And I had opened a package of sliced ham at this house here and put some on a sandwich. And then, I don't know how many weeks later, I had forgotten when I opened it. I came back here last week and I was rooting around in the refrigerator looking for something to slap on a sandwich. 
and I almost had a can of tuna. Oh, how I wish I had chosen the tuna. This ginger will help settle my stomach. Ginger chew. Um, because instead I chose the ham. I looked at it, couldn't remember when I opened it. Red flag number one. I smelled it and it seemed fine, but you never can tell with some types of bacterium. What I should have done was nuked it in the microwave since I wasn't quite sure. Uh, mistake number two, I also failed to follow my rule about food, especially meat in the refrigerator, which is three and out. If open meat has been there for three days or more, it has to be thrown, okay? I didn't follow any of those rules. Instead, I made that sandwich and had the worst. It's almost a week now. And it's finally starting to go away. Oh, I can still feel it. That's why you haven't seen me making videos for quite some time. But let's see what's playing. Enough about my tale of woe. That's boring. Um. Bathtubs over Broadway has a zero star rating. I guess that's pretty bad. Or no rating. Aquaman. Both director. Look, I have a little photo for Aquaman. See there? It's like Poseidon and Trident. I think it's Trident. Jason Momoa and Amber Heard in Aquaman. Let's see what they say. Both director James Wan and Jason Momoa have a surprisingly firm grasp of who Aquaman is. And they ultimately, more than two hours later, steer their film towards sincerity and away from bombast. I assume that means they had two plus hours of bombast and insincerity before they get to that point. Not a very strong recommendation. It's surely some measure of accomplishment that Aquaman, for all its messy grandiosity, culminates in its hero, therapeutically saying, let's talk. And it's uttered not to a manatee, but to a brother. 143 minutes. Sci-fi, violence, and action. I am going to pass on Aquaman. It looks like a real bore. A child's film, perhaps. Next up, we have Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh, they rate Aquaman as two stars. Okay, two stars. Next up, Bohemian Rhapsody. One of the better tunes from the classic rock era. I just heard geese. Can you hear them? Those are Canada geese, if you have earbuds and you can... 
barely here. Anyway, in this Bohemian Rhapsody, the power comes mainly from the tunes and from Freddie Mercury, Rami Malek's magnific magnificent stage presence. Malek makes for a show-stopping silhouetto of a man. Silhouetto? I never heard of that. For thematic elements, it's PG-13. Drug content and language. Two stars. I'd rather just listen to the Freddie Mercury tunes. Those noises are not a cat being tortured. Not a squeaky wheel. They are a flock of Canadian geese passing overhead. And that's what they sound like. They fly at night mostly. Because it's actually late right now and I'm quite sleepy which is a very good time for me to make ASMR because when I'm sleepy, I'm very relaxed. And I'm hoping this would relax you as well. Bumblebee. Hardcore fans may be unhappy there's not enough robot on robot violence or turned off by the meat cute between teen and bot. I already know I'm gonna pass this one. But hopefully it will attract an audience either tired or turned off by the franchise's past rigidity and addiction to spectacle. This is what we need. Smaller, quieter, more human. Okay. Next up we have, Can You Ever Forgive Me? While it's corrosively humorous, this appears to be a comedy, the film is essentially a fact-based drama with poignant psychological insights. Oh, sorry, I meant to say poignant psychological insights about notions like insecurity, isolation, and honesty. Uh, it also represents a potential career resurgence for McCarthy, transitioning her away from lowbrow comedies like Life of the Party to thoughtful, serious fare. R rating for language, including some sexual references and brief drug use, 106 minutes. I uh, don't think I'll watch that one. Next up we have Crazy Rich Asians. No, I'm not making up the title. There it is. C for yourself. Crazy Rich Asians. Mm. I married kind of a crazy Asian. Oh, but the rich part might be missing. No, I'm just kidding, of course. She's a wonderful person. All right. Constance Wu plays Rachel Chu. Is that poetry? Constance Wu plays Rachel Chu, an economics professor at New York University, whose Singapore-born businessman boyfriend, Nick Young, I dare you to say all that fast ten times, suggests a trip to the Far East. His proposal is they fly back to Singapore for his best friend's wedding and to meet his family. It's only as they are boarding the airplane and are led 
to an entire bedroom suite on the aircraft that Rachel realizes her longtime boyfriend is filthy, stinking rich. Okay? Some suggestive content and language. It's a two-hour movie. They gave it three stars. But they don't say if it's a comedy or a drama. Hmm. So I don't know. You can take your chances on that one. It's interesting enough so that I might watch it when it comes out on Netflix or Amazon Prime. Next up we have Escape Room. Two stars only. The thing is, it says here, Escape Room room isn't really all that bad, just kind of silly, but it takes a moment to readjust your expectations after that condescending beginning and a very phoned-in introduction to the unlucky six Chicago strangers who all receive a mysterious box and decide what the heck. Let's check out this escape room. Curiously, no one seems concerned about the odd premise that this team activity could have a single winner, or perhaps they all think they'll win the $10,000. I guess it becomes more clear as people start dying in the rooms. Sounds contrived to me. I'm going to pass. Let's see here. Um, da -da -da. That looks boring. Green book. That looks boring. And there they're doing stuff that I can't even bother to read because it looks so boring. I don't see any films here that look as if they're a must-watch or even a should-watch. Next up we have Holmes and Watson. Zero star rating. I guess they don't like it. Holmes and Watson It says here, veers into a comedy cubist zone where jokes just aren't recognizable. It's almost as if Will Ferrell and John Riley have no script or even a premise to work with. But other than that, they really loved it. Rated PG-13 for crude sexual material. Uh, I don't mind sexual material, but not if it's crude, okay? Should be refined. Some violence, language, and drug references. 90 minutes of absolute wretched boredom. Okay, I added the wretched and boredom part, all right? Next up, if Beale Street could talk, three and a half stars. What's their top rating here? Four star would be the top, so they're giving this one a pretty good rating. The story is loosely about a pregnant woman, Tish and her partner Fonny, F-O-N-N-Y. Never seen anyone named Fonny before, have you? Who has been wrongly jailed for a crime he did not commit. Tish and Fonny are both achingly young and beautiful, full of promise and hope and even amid all the institutional obstacles, 
and injustices that they face in daily life in 1970s Harlem, like not being able to rent their own apartment or buy groceries at the local mart without being reassessed by a police officer. R rating for language and some sexual content. It's two hours long. Honestly, it looks like another bore fest, like two people dialoguing in an apartment. Next up, Mary Poppins Returns. Now, how are you going to improve on the original Mary Poppins with Julie Andrews, huh? That you saw when you were eight years old, right? Uh, what do they say about it? It's so slavishly faithful to the original film, which was a boundary-breaking, completely original movie musical, that Mary Poppins Returns is just a lot more of the same, which is pleasing but a bit dull. Sounds a bit dull. I don't like sequels that can't break any new ground. And it's time for me to break new ground with a sugar-free um, hard candy. But first I think I'll have another sip of this atrocious libation that I showed you on the previous video, the whole video. This stuff is undrinkable. But maybe it will jumpstart. It will be a probiotic for my malfunctioning digestive system. Because I need some, some kind of vino or something to get something growing in there. Oh my gosh. I don't think you could find a worse concoction on earth than this. Cahol. It's a coconut water liquor. But I can't say I recommend it to anyone except the very strong of heart or weak of palate. Okay. What's next? Mary Queen of Scots. Two and a half stars. Mary Queen of Scots often feels more dutiful than imaginative. Haven't they made this movie many times before? Um, let's see. Despite some non-traditional casting choices, the drama transpires in an episodic collection of expository scenes meant to impart huge amounts of information with efficiency and clarity. That just doesn't sound very interesting. Time for my little uh, caramel sugar-free. Okay. How about the mule? Three stars. A 90-year-old horticulturist and World War II veteran is caught transporting three million dollars worth of cocaine through Michigan for a Mexican drug cartel. Doesn't say anything about whether it's good or bad. Just gives you a tiny plot synopsis. Rated R, two hours long. Okay. What's your favorite anti-drug theme movie about cocaine. Of course, Scarface was pretty good, but I think maybe the Johnny Depp film, Blow, 
was the best one for showing how a true story of how a drug dealer comes to a bad end in spite all the millions and all the flash of that lifestyle. Next up we have a movie called On the Basis of Sex. Don't get excited because it's nothing having to do with that three letter word. On the Basis of Sex is an intimate portrait of the marriage between Ruth Bader Ginsburg, played by Felicity Jones, and her husband Martin. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, if you are unaware, is one of the nine Supreme Court justices uh, sitting today on the court, or in her case, she's been absent lately. But she's about 185 years old, so thinking about her and her marriage is not really something that sounds interesting to me. But anyway, let's see what it says. Um, the role their family dynamic played, her and her husband, in pursuit of her career. It's refreshing to see a biopic where the wife is the agent of toil, change, and struggle and the husband is a supportive, loving uh, backup who cooks dinner too. In other words, the husband is a wuss with no personality or career of his own. Okay? Uh, why that's supposed to be wonderful, I'm not quite sure. I can see two type A's getting married, but I can't quite see the virtue of a weak, you know, sort of in the background husband guy in a marriage. You can call me misogynistic if you want to. I don't mind. Next up, Ralph Breaks the Internet. They give this three stars. The sequel directed by Rich Moore picks up with Ralph and Vanellope living a happy existence as characters in their each in their respective video games. A crisis occurs when the driving wheel for Vanellope's Sugar Rush game oh sorry I mean Sugar Rush game is broken and if a replacement isn't found her game will be unplugged hmm. sounds a bit like a movie for teens so i might pass replicas a scientist becomes obsessed with bringing back his family members who died in a traffic accident. Oh, that sounds like a ripoff of the Stephen King story, Pet Cemetery, showing there's nothing new under the sun. Next up we have RBG. They give it a high rating. And this film is about none other than, once again, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the 185-year-old Supreme Court Justice. This is awfully strange. Two movies coming out about Ruth Bader Ginsburg at the same time. A person none of you ever heard of or cared about in the past, except in the most distant and peripheral sense. And um, 
I think they gave it a higher rating only because of political purposes. So I'm not sure that would be an interesting watch. I'll pass. Next up, we have shoplifters. Hmm. Despite some odd choices that are never quite fleshed out in a satisfying way, Shoplifters is a slow but captivating burn that may leave you questioning your own hard-set ideas of right, wrong, and family. Sounds a bit like a premise where is shoplifting okay if you must do it to feed your family? I don't know. But it doesn't sound so interesting. So far, I haven't seen a single film here that I feel like watching. The next up is Spider-Man. You know, I'm just not into the whole superhero, bad CGI effect genre. They bore me to death. I'd rather sleep than watch one of those films. But maybe I'm just crazy that way. I'm used to films with good writing and a great plot and great directing and great acting and great cinematography. So when you just give me some action crap with canned lines, it doesn't even matter who the actor is, and lots of computer-generated effects. I just want to snore, okay? But that's just me. Some of you tell me, are there any good ones out there? What about, um, uh, I can't even remember. It'll come to me. There was one I was thinking about watching. But anyway, next up, A Star is Born. Three, by the way, they gave Spider-Man four stars. And I forgot to read the description. Miles Morales, so if you're into that genre, maybe this is the one to choose. Tell me what film you have seen lately that you enjoy, and then maybe we'll check it out. Miles Morales becomes the Spider-Man of his reality and crosses paths with his counterparts from other dimensions to stop a threat to all reality. PG-rated Frenetic sequences of animated action violence. Thematic elements. 117 minutes of wasted time. Oh no. 117 minutes long. Okay. Well, that's the highest rated film on this whole page. Everything else is anywhere from zero to three stars, mostly two or three. Next up, A Star is Born. This one gets three and a half stars, though. I think that was an award-winning film when Barbara Streisand did it. It says here, it's hard not to go into a star is born without a lot of prejudgments. Even if you have not seen the other three versions, I didn't know there was three more versions, the mere fact they exist and with such formidable talent is enough to make anyone scoff at the fact that Hollywood keeps dusting off this well-worn story about fame and love and addiction. Leave that all at the door, though, 
because a star is born is simply terrific. I guess they like that one. All right. They don't say anything else. It's rated what? Rated R for some language, some sexuality, and substance abuse. Well, if substance abuse is rated R, then consider walking down any street in Oregon to be a um, an R rated experience because that's what's going on everywhere now all right next film is called the upside they gave it half of a star one half of one star so i don't think there's going to be much upside in the review to the movie but let's see what they say Few films in memory have squandered so much acting talent in such a cliché-ridden, exploitive, and dishonest way. The film stars Kevin Hart as a lazy, skirt-chasing ex-con, hoping to reconnect with his estranged wife and son. He accidentally gets a job taking care of an obscenely wealthy New York businessman who became a paraplegic while hang gliding. You can virtually write the rest as the upside unspools. Hmm. It's squandered, cliche-ridden, exploitive, and dishonest. But other than that, they loved the film. I think I'll pass. Last but not least, Fox Lux. Yes, that's how it's spelled. V-O-X-L-U-X. -X. An unusual set of circumstances brings unexpected success to a pop star. That's all it says. R-rated for some violence and drug content. Ooh. They don't tell us much there. The upside. Now, the one they rate the worst of what I was just reading is the one they give a giant picture to on all of this listed stuff. Is that strange? That's the picture from The Upside. And that's the film they give the worst review to. Mighty bizarre. Maybe it's like a train wreck thing. They want you to see it. See the train wreck. I am so tempted to eat this. And I am so not going to. I've had it sitting here for several days. Uh, and until I get over my food poisoning, I'm not going to dump sugar into my system. But you see, this is a Canadian Mars bar with maple in it. See those maple leaves? So, what I'll do is, I'll make a video, ASMR in the future, and I'll sample this, but I won't eat the whole thing. I'll give some to Joanne. Oh, by the way, I won this hat the other day when I was playing poker. Uh, not by doing anything skillful in the game, although I did make a three-way tie for first place. We chopped three ways in the small tournament. But because I got quads, 
uh, and when you get quads they give you one of these hats I haven't seen quads in a while if you want to know what quads are it's four of a kind in Texas Hold'em and I got the quads on a very unlikely hand I came into the pot with a deuce I should have a I should have a pack of cards here to show you I came into the hand with a deuce four of hearts suited which is an unplayable hand but I was on the big blind which is a forced bet and no one raised so that's why I was in the hand with the two four of hearts the flop came up with two deuces and a king so now I've got three deuces in addition the king was the king of hearts so I've also got a potential runner runner really bad flush draw which I don't care about at that point however I do like not only do I love the three deuces but I love seeing the king because no one raised before the flop and I'm thinking if anybody's got no one's going to put me on a deuce um, and no one else has one and anybody with high cards a, high, a higher pair or basically any high cards but especially a king is going to bet into me right and so I just check in early position and sure enough there's all this betting and raising <laughs> gets back around to me and I just call their bet their raise and uh, the other calls because I don't want to let on yet that I've got three deuces the turn card comes and it's another deuce now I've got four deuces there's betting and raising and all kinds of stuff in front of me comes around to I check you know to still hide my three do my four quad deuces now comes around to me now I decide to re-raise because I'm thinking there's three deuces on the board so everybody figures they have a full house now with whatever bad pair they have right and people with a king think they have the best full house because there's a king on the board so by re-raising you know I won't knock people out they'll be happy to call and sure enough they did so they all call my re-raise which was the third raise really and then the river comes and it's of all things an ace which now I love to see that ace because I'm hoping people have an ace in their hand too and uh, there was also a potential uh, flush on the board as I recall yeah it was another heart yep but I don't care about that so then um, there's all this this time I lead out with a bet and um, this is a small tournament so we don't have a lot of tournament chips so two people go all in with their chips and they don't have many left because so many bets have occurred by then so they go all in two people another person calls who's not all in yet but has more chips it gets to me and i get to shove all in and force that third person all in and then i flip over you know <laughs> my terrible hand of deuce four you know and they all had a full house right so everybody thought they had a possible winner at that point so it was a very nice that 
enabled me to go the distance and do a three-way. I don't usually make a deal when it gets down to three-handed in the tournament. But in this case I did because then I had some bad luck later, especially short-handed, and I was the short stack between me and the other two opponents, one of which was a good player, one of which was kind of an unknown to me, but he was reasonably good, and I thought, they both have more than twice as many chips as me. One of the guys proposes a three-way split to take first, second, and third prize money and split them equally three ways. And I jumped at it because that's to, to my advantage at that point. If I'd have had the chip lead, um, I never would have made a deal like that. So anyway, that's way off topic, but that's the story of how I got this hat. Why did I go into all of that? I know why. Because I promised somebody, some of my subbies, I would do more poker talk in the future. And I will. This isn't worthwhile as poker strategy talk, because there really wasn't much strategy in this particular hand. It just kind of played itself. But I will do some poker strategy talk in the future, including two or three terrible mistakes I made in recent games, as well as hands I played correctly and why they panned out for me. I try to keep track of both because I don't like making the same mistake twice. Anyway, all right, everyone, take care. I hope you enjoy this video. I hope it's relaxed you a little bit. I'm relaxed. I will soon sleep. And um, until next time, don't ASMR and drive. All right. Bye-bye.